Well, welcome back everybody uh, to the Cerebral Blood Flow virtual seminar series. I'm very pleased to see everyone again today. Um, I'm Caroline Rickards from the University of North Texas Health Science Center, for those who don't already know me from the last few sessions. Um, and my co-host and co-organizer is uh, Patrice Brassard from uh, Canada. Um, so today uh, we have our sixth session, um, sorry, our fifth session uh, from uh, Kevin Shoemaker, who will be our keynote speaker. Uh, followed by four abstract talks. Uh, just a reminder in terms of our rules of engagement, uh, so please keep your microphone on mute and your video off throughout the session. There'll be some time for questions at the end of uh, both the keynote set, uh, presentation and the abstract talks. Um, if you have a question, if you could either use the raise your hand feature, uh, which is in the chat function, or you can write your question in the chat function and we will ask it for you. Uh, the session will be recorded and posted on the Cerebral Order Regulation Research Network website uh, within the week. So please take a look out or keep a look out for those uh, session recordings uh, each week. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to be a member of the Cerebral Order Regulation Research Network, then please send me, your, send me an email with your CV and I'll add you to the mailing list. So today, as I mentioned, uh, our keynote speaker is Dr. Kevin Shoemaker. Uh, Dr. Shoemaker is a distinguished university professor and also uh, acting associate vice president for research at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And Dr. Shoemaker today will be presenting on the understanding and navigating the role of large cerebral arteries in cerebral blood flow regulation. Um, and they, that will then be followed by four great abstract talks from trainees and early stage investigators. So Kevin, I will pass it over to you now. Thank you, uh, Caroline and Patrice for uh, the invitation to participate in this exceptional uh, series of uh, talks that you put together in seminars. It really is a unique opportunity and uh, we're glad to be part of it. And thank you all for, for joining in this afternoon, at least this afternoon and where I am. Um, I hope that what we present to you is at least interesting and perhaps helpful, but it's just reflecting some of the, the things that we've been working on over the last decade or so in the context of understanding cerebral blood flow. The title, Understanding and Navigating the Role of Large Cerebral Arteries, comes largely from the problem that large cerebral arteries present to the community based on the technologies that we have access to. And uh, some of the things that, that um, Aaron, Chris, uh, Barra, and Savannah are going to present are some of the things that we've been doing where you don't really need uh, MRI technologies, for example, and where TCD is the, the answer to what we're trying to sort through. Um, I want to begin, of course, by thanking people who show up in this presentation. Uh, George Serador, who many of you know, uh, started all of this for me personally uh, back in 1999. And the rest of these folks, Nicole and Joe and Bara and Jenna, Chris, Savannah and Aaron, all factor into the data that I'm going to show you and uh, data that's coming up in the next four talks as well. Okay, so large cerebral arteries. What does that mean? These are the arteries that lie at the base of the brain. They either form or come off of the circle of Willis. So they would include the basilar artery, the left and right posterior cerebral arteries, the left and the right middle cerebral arteries, the left and the right anterior cerebral arteries. And we're including the internal carotids in this picture as well. You can see them sort of underneath the middle cerebral artery because we're looking at the brain top down. Uh, they factor into some of this as well because part of the internal carotid is actually inside the cranium. But those are the vessels we're talking about. Now, I couldn't pass up a talk on brain blood flow without using Rune Aislid's picture, just like everybody else in the series. Um, but this is where it all began in 1982 when uh, Dr. Aislid presented his technique to study blood flow in the brain using low frequency ultrasound aimed at the large arteries and showed some of the benefits and the results that you can get from it. And since then, of course, uh, we know the benefits. There are numerous of transcranial Doppler ultrasound because of its high temporal resolution, its unique ability to, to be aimed at different vessels. And it's, it's pretty stable under certain circumstances. As you saw last week, you can even perform exercise. And uh, last session, I mean, you can perform exercise and study the effect of foot strike, for example, which is kind of interesting. Um, of course, it presents a problem, uh, this technique, in that, as we understand it, of course, this 
provides information about the velocity of blood flow in that artery. And we operate under the hope and the assumption that that velocity signal is analogous to blood flow. And it's very good at detecting velocity, by the way. And you can see very subtle changes uh, in the velocity profile and the velocity values uh, over time on a beat by beat basis. But of course, it operates on the assumption that the cross sectional area does not change, which begs the question then does the cerebral, does the cross sectional area of large cerebral arteries change? And under what circumstances might that be? All right. So, uh, part of the way that we look at, at science in general, and I've sort of been around long enough to know that technology drives some of the science that we can do, and in turn, the science we do drives the need for new technologies. Uh, so this is a bit of a timeline around the study of cerebrovascular control from the context of non-invasive measures in humans. Before that was possible, before the 1980s, there were animal studies done in dogs and rats and so forth, I'm going to get to some of those studies later on in my talk, but really this story begins in 1982 with Dr. Aislett's work. And magnetic resonance imaging didn't show up in the scene until about the late 80s, and it was very um, meager in its ability to detect images from, the, from what we see now. But at that time, when MRI was coming on board, TCD was exponentially increasing in the number of publications, that's what the y-axis is, that are being produced every year. And here you have your, your on the x-axis. Number of publications have more or less stabilized over the last 20 years. But during this period, uh, and this is when I was in grad school, by the way, there's um, a lot of activity around TCD because of the new technology. And then we started realizing back around uh, you know, 1995 or so that you could use this to study the neurovascular coupling phenomena that we can measure with TCD. MRI was here, and then our first MRI study was done here in 1999, and I'm going to show you some of those data. But then better MRI came along. Um, we went from 1.5 Tesla to 4, or 3 and 4, and now we're at 7, 9.4 here at Western. So with better technology comes better resolution and, and some other things that you can do with it. So um, with that, I'm going to show you some MRI data. The first study to use MRI uh, imaging was by Valdez in 1997. And they studied six people using a 1.5 Tesla magnet, which is still useful uh, today. Uh, but back then, it's what they had. And uh, young, healthy people, and they did a hyperventilation study. They only measured the arterial PCO2 values in two people. But nonetheless, they went from an average of 39.4 down to 27, so a good hyperventilatory response. And what they measured in the middle cerebral artery was the diameter change from 3.4 millimeters to 3.3, a, a change of one, a percent change of one. And that was relatively meaningless. And it's definitely um, within the variations or the, of the MRI sensitivity, meaning that uh, you couldn't detect a 1% difference between a change in the diameter with the resolution that was afforded by 1.5 Tesla back then. In 1999 then, um, some years later, we found uh, working at Western University with George Serador, again, 1.5 Tesla system, a uh, few more subjects, similar age range, and they were receiving a 6% CO2 dose uh, using a linear image down through the middle cerebral artery under conditions of normal capnia, hypercapnia, and hypocapnia. Top figure shows you the velocity tracing, or the velocity values, I'm sorry. On going from normal capnia to hyper, of course, it goes up. And when you go from normal capnia to hypocapnia, well, velocity goes down. But the major outcome of the study, of course, was the diameter of the middle cerebral artery. You see a little bit of a blip here with hypercapnia, but that was within the noise of the system, of the, of the uh, signal coming from the MRI system. So, and it came to be within one to three percent on average, maybe four. And the conclusions of this study then, under the conditions of the study, changes in MCA diameter were not detected. So under these conditions, uh, the idea is that flow velocity as measured by transcranial Doppler was a good analog of total flow. Uh, 
fast forward uh, 15 years, and we're now working with a three Tesla system, a uh, few more subjects in our sample size, and similar age range, and again, a 6% 6, 6 CO2 dose. Again, looking at the middle cerebral artery, and uh, over a range of end tidal CO2 from hyperventilation down to about 25 to a hypercapnic situation on average around 50. And our normal capnic value is here in the middle. And what you see then is this sort of dose response on going from hypocapnia to normal to hypercapnia, where the diameter is in fact increasing across all subjects, although we had different number of subjects in the hypercapnia than we did in the hypo. But the point is that using uh, this kind of a system, and we had better sensitivity, better spatial resolution, you start to see that the differentiating factor of uh, values of end tidal CO2 on your middle cerebral artery diameter. This was in fact statistically significant, ranging from 10 to 15% across individuals. This simply shows you a profile of the change in cross-sectional area here, and that's in the dark circles, as a function of the end tidal uh, CO2, which is on the y-axis here on the right, which is the open circles over time. So a baseline period and then every minute. And you can see the pattern with uh, elevating your inspired CO2 levels by 6% gas you get a very large increase in entire CO2 very quickly and it's pretty stable. The diameter, uh, two things to show you here. One is there's a lot of variability between individuals on the, the baseline value of the MCA and on its response. But here there's a general pattern that over about two to three minutes of hypercapnia, you start to see the MCA show up as a larger diameter. So it doesn't change a lot, but again, we're in the, we're in the 10 to 15% range. And uh, you know, we're also limited by the, the rather poor temporal resolution of magnetic resonance imaging. At the time, uh, we could only make one measure every minute and uh, get these kinds of values. Now, Bara, when, when she talks, will show you a, a different approach that we've been taking. But the point is, the MCA diameter doesn't change right away. It takes some time to increase. Um, and you might need a sufficient dose of CO2 to see that. Now, Ryan Hoyland has, uh, in his comprehensive physiology paper, which I highly recommend, um, it, it's, it's a, a very well done um, project that must have taken him a considerable amount of time to gather all that information, but it's a brilliant read. But he sort of summarized the data that had been accruing uh, since 1997 on uh, these diameter changes and presenting them here on the, the y-axis as a percent a change and then as a function of different changes in entitled CO2. And then he forced some sort of a sigmoidal curve through that. And you generally see the pattern in hypercapnia, you get dilation. In hypocapnia, you get constriction relative to normal capnia here at zero. And a couple of things emerge here. We see the patterns emerge, of course, but they're variable. Um, and there seems to be some sort of a ceiling between five and 10%, at least in these values. Uh, and hypocapnia, it's a little more var variable yet. So there's still a lot of data to be gathered. We don't know what's happening in this range very well. Um, we don't know if it matters how long you're under the hypercapnic or hypocapnic dose. And all of these kinds of details need to be sorted. But the bottom line is these large arteries are vasoactive in response to uh, changes in arterial CO2. Now this does create a problem in the sense that blood flow is a function of velocity times the cross-sectional area. And what I want to show you now is sort of the, the possible errors in interpretation that we can make if we uh, ignore that fact. So on the left figure, we're just showing you average values of blood flow in the middle cerebral artery during a condition of going from baseline to hypercapnia on these two bars, and then from baseline to hypocapnia in these two bars. And you can see what I just showed you. Blood flow goes up when, with hypercapnia and blood flow goes down with hypo. But on the right side here, you can see the potential error that you make. 
So here's the percent change relative to baseline of the change in flow under conditions here of the, uh, when you, you actually calculate blood flow in these bars using the diameter change versus here in the gray bar if you only use the velocity and ignore the diameter change. And you can see there's roughly a 50% uh, difference between these two values. And you get uh, not quite as large a difference here, but the reduction in cerebral blood flow through the MCA artery is calculated to be less if you don't use the diameter than if you do. Similarly, if you think about cerebral vascular reactivity and you apply this to uh, flow or the diameter for that matter, but these are flow data. Um, you got four lines here. Ignore the, these two with hatched lines. That's the internal carotid artery, actually kind of a linear response. And what we're plotting here is the cerebral vascular reactivity per uh, millimeter mercury and tidal CO2 as a function of time. And we have two, two uh, lines here. One is the dark line with the filled circles. That is the cerebral vascular reactivity calculated when you use velocity only. And then the dotted line with open circles is the reactivity that you calculate if you use total flow uh, incorporating the diameter change or the cross-sectional area change. And you can see they're different. And the, that's, that's the, the difference you might call an error or an underestimation of the actual reactivity or flow if you aren't using the diameter under conditions where it's changing. And this, this error does amount to 30 to 50% in some cases. So all of those data tell us then that um, from a physiological perspective, that these large arteries are vasoactive, at least to CO2. I don't know of any data that has studied them in the context of neural control, um, but they are active, and that means that they offer some changes and contribution to the resistance to flow within the brain. It's not just arterioles. And just to sort of emphasize that fact, um, this picture is probably one that everyone has seen here. This simply shows the pressure drop in the cardiovascular system. And it's illustrated, it's used to teach the different levels of or the different segments of the cardiovascular system. And at what point is the resistance to flow the highest? And that's translated into the, the largest drop in blood pressure across that segment. So we start on the left with the aorta and then the large arteries. You get into the small arteries and then in the arterioles is where the pressure falls and some in the capillaries. This is the area, the largest area of vasoactive control in most beds. And, um, you know, but that's in contrast to what we just saw in terms of the large arteries in the brain because they would be classified as large arteries based on this schema. Now this is where I wanna take you back to some of the literature that occurred before TCD came on. And, you know, studying brain blood flow in humans, you needed some radioactive uh, approaches and other things like that, but in the in the, this is these are data taken from a rat and a dog, I believe, are in here. But you're looking at four different organs: the brain, the heart, skeletal muscle, and the mesentery. And the y-axis shows you the uh, the values in blood pressure as a percent of aortic pressure. On the x-axis here, you have various dynam diameters of vessels. So we're going from a large artery here, uh, which would be uh, like an internal carotid or carotid artery in a human, I suppose. And then down to 100 here is like a, a peel vessel, one of the small peel vessels, not the smallest necessarily, but a small peel vessel on the outside of the human brain. In here then, you're getting into the arterioles, which would be after the feed artery and skeletal muscle. This value of 100 also relates to a feed artery that would be penetrating into skeletal muscle to to deliver blood flow there, as well as in the mesentery. So there's one large conclusion from this graph, excuse me. Unlike skeletal muscle, where it, the pressure does not fall till you get into the arterioles, same in the mesenteric circulation, the pressure from the, in the brain has already fallen from the aorta by the time it gets into the brain, and then it continues to fall across the large arteries, even into the peel vessels. 
and the difference then at these vessels here is quite quite remarkable where very little change has occurred in skeletal muscle or mesentery but a lot has occurred in the brain a lot of pressure drop across the segment suggests that these vessels contribute to the resistance in the brain uh, to emphasize the point further this is a study uh, done earlier than what i just showed you by uh, dr heistat's group that's a clever study this is performed in a canine model and what they were trying to do is measure the pressure difference across the large arteries at the base of the brain so here we have the common carotid circle of willis and the basilar artery they tied off the vertebral arteries so blood flow could come in this way but it could not go out or it could not come in that way either the only way thing that could happen is blood flow comes in here and it's then distributed amongst these branches to perfuse the brain and it's the pressure gradient then can be calculated across these segments because they measured pressure in a side artery here going into the carotid as well as into a side artery here at the entrance to the basilar artery so they have it be able to measure the pressure difference the results are below uh, the left graph shows you total cerebral vascular resistance and then the right graph shows you the large cerebral artery res resistance so whole brain or just the arteries at the base of the brain on the right a range of uh, pco2 levels from a normal capnic here sort of in the middle and then uh, hypocapnic here and a hypercapnic on the, this one here 56 and these are measures of resistance remember so anytime the vessel constricts you'll have higher resistance and you see this pattern showing up that across the brain as you would expect resistance goes up in hypocapnia and resistance to flow is decreased when the brain dilates in response to hypercapnia and uh, this pattern also emerges across the large cerebral arteries it's not just the whole brain but these vessels also respond in a similar way such that in this experiment about 20 percent of the resistance to the entire brain was provided by the resistance to flow that was measured in these large cerebral arteries so it's not a small amount of uh, resistance applied to, to the brain in terms of flow so what we could do then with this graph is sort of modify it a little bit with a purple line that then suggests what is likely happening in the brain is that the the fall in pressure is actually occurring much earlier than the arterioles it's actually occurring across these large arteries now we might ask what's the rationale or what's the reason for this kind of a system um, you know we can talk about auto regulation or a variety of things like that but one thing we do know is that you know if you need to protect the brain then and have every level of the vascular every vascular segment contribute to that protection it seems like a good system and that that appears to be what's happening here is that these vessels contribute a lot to either the auto regulatory or the steady state levels of flow that we measure in the brain okay so switching gears a little bit i, I want to present some some resu results uh, just very sort of high level results on conditions that modify large artery dilation to hypercapnia the first one is regional heterogeneity so here uh bara alkazraji when she was working in my lab uh used the seven tesla system and we studied eight people again young healthy folks um, and the range of end tidal co2s that were achieved were 31 to 48. 48 refers to a hypercapnia so all of the vessels above here are the indication of dilation in response to a 48 millimeter mercury uh, in, uh, level of end tidal co2 these darker bars below zero on the y-axis refer to the hypocapnic state or the vasoconstriction that occurred so this here is a, a measure of reactivity in these different vascular uh, art these different arteries sorry and the arteries were all of the large arteries so we, we measured the whole brain with this study and uh, beginning with the basilar and then the left and the right posterior cerebral artery the left and the right middle cerebral artery the left and the right internal carotid and the left and the right anterior cerebral going basically from the back of the brain to the front so a couple things emerge first of all all of them dilate to hypercapnia and all of them constrict to hypocapnia but they don't all dilate the same amount and this is a relative amount so it, 
of course, their baseline diameters are going to have uh, some, uh, play, uh, some role to play in the different values here. But it seems that the reactivity uh, to changes in entitled CO2 are really large in the posterior circulation and the anterior brain, like in the frontal cortex, much less so in the internal carotids and the, even the middle cerebral artery. Um, so those are, those are two patterns that emerge here. Uh, so you got heterogeneity across the, uh, the vessels going from the back of the brain to the front of the brain with the middle cerebral artery actually being one of the least reactive, at least in this study. And not many studies like this have been done. So we, haven't, we can't say for sure, but this is a general pattern that we see. Um, secondly, age affects the dilation of the middle cerebral artery in response to hypercapnia. Again, uh, at uh, seven Tesla, uh, Nicole Coverdale, when she was doing her doctoral studies in our lab, uh, she looked at a group of young adults 12, around 24 years, older adults, 10 of them, uh, who were average age around 66, and again, a 6%, in, uh, uh, sorry, 6 gas concentration to drive a change in entire CO2. That's a mistake, sorry. And she measured the change in cross-sectional area of the middle cerebral artery in young adults in the dark bars. The white bars reflect older adults. And here is the percent change in the cross-sectional area uh, in the same groups. You can see large error bars. Again, we have this uh, inter-individual variation that's, that's quite large, but the pattern of change is relatively consistent and it became statistically significant in the percent change, uh, showing you that as a general observation, older folks, even though they're healthy, have a, a reduced ability to dilate these vessels in response to the same uh, change in entitled CO2. And here we have some unpublished data that uh, Barra was part of as well. And uh, we've been looking at ischemic heart disease patients for, for quite some time in various contexts. And one of them is to study the cerebral vascular control in these folks. We've been studying these people in this regard because these folks have a, have a higher risk of developing dementia you know, 10 years after their cardiac event than others do. So we're interested in some of these cerebrovascular outcomes in these folks. So this is a kind of a complicated slide, lots of bars to keep track, at, keep track of, uh, but here's the relative change in cross-sectional area in response to uh, a dose of entitled CO2. There's two groups, but the, uh, the ischemic heart disease patients were studied before and then after six months of cardiac rehab. So the, the, dash, the hatch bars here are after cardiac rehab, the open bars are before, and they're being compared to a control group of similarly aged but otherwise healthy individuals. A general pattern emerges based as a main effect. You can see that cardiac patients have diminished uh, reactivity of these large arteries across the brain compared to older adults. Again, you see the large variability in the standard deviation of these results. And these data suggest then that after cardiac rehab for six months, that some of this uh, reactivity was restored back towards control levels. But we have to be a little bit careful on this interpretation because the, ag the absolute level of end tidal CO2 was achieved was actually a little bit more in the post cardiac rehab than it was in the pre. We, weren't, we didn't have a, uh, a sort of an end tidal clamping system uh, available to us when this study was done. So when you recalculate these data as a reactivity, as a function of the change in the entitled CO2 stimulus, you see a slightly different story emerge. The cardiac patients still had an impaired uh, dilation compared to controls, but that was not restored. The reactivity of that is was not restored with cardiac rehab unless you gave them a little bit more CO2, and then the, the absolute level of dilation would have responded. But nonetheless, uh, the point here is that ischemic heart disease also impairs dilation of these large arteries, uh, just like it does with control. And also remember, these controls had a smaller dilatory response to hypercapnia than did healthy controls, which were a little bit higher. <clears throat> 
So uh, age and then disease have a progressive impairment, it, it appears anyway, on these uh, large arteries. I'll just skip through that. Potential mechanisms. Here we know very little uh, about these large arteries. We have some uh, evidence. Again, I'm going to use uh, uh, Ryan Hoyland's paper just to show you uh, this nice schematic that he produced. The point here, and I'm not going to go through the details, but the idea is that how does CO2 work? That's the question. And uh, he, he provides all the compelling evidence to suggest that CO2 works by modifying the pH of the interstitial fluid around the astrocytes and the smooth muscle, which then creates a variety of dilatory mechanisms of the smooth muscle. CO2 has relatively little direct impact on endothelial cells, except that if you dilate smooth muscle, you will increase the velocity of blood flow, which will then create a shear stress mechanism, which will then act on calcium channels and the ENOS pathways as examples, causing dilators to be produced. So the question, if, if this is in fact the case of impaired dilation in our older folks or our folks with ischemic heart disease, then you know, how can we test that in a human model? Uh, we haven't really gone down this path too far, but I will show you a little bit of, of data that we've been collecting. Um, in our lab, it's a long way from the hospital, so we don't, we don't have a lot of activity around uh, blocking ENOS pathways and so forth. But what we can do is give sodium nitroglycerin to folks, which is a sublingual dose used a lot by cardiac patients with angina pain. And sodium nitroglycerin, uh, just showing you real quick that this is a, it basically donates nitric oxide um, at the end of its pathway, which then activates a cyclic GMP pathway to cause dilation. So in this study, we're looking at all of the nine arteries, again, at the base of the brain and looking at the cross-sectional area under conditions of uh, baseline, which is the, the hatched bars, under a placebo uh, that we built, and then uh, under nitroglycerin. And you can see in most of these nine arteries, well, at least one, two, three, four, five, six of them, two-thirds of them, you see a nitroglycerin-induced dilation. Uh, compared to baseline and to the placebo. So most of these arteries do dilate uh, to sodium nitroglycerin as well, which is, uh, makes a, a potential tool to study some mechanisms. Now here's very, very preliminary data on, uh, on the problem of what's causing dilation problems in the older folks and in those with ischemic heart disease. And each one of these uh, received this dose of sodium nitroglycerin, and we measured the change in the MCA uh, dilation in response to this drug. And again, lots of variability, but statistically, there's no difference between these young, these older controls, and the older patients with ischemic heart disease. And showing that all of them can respond to this drug, which makes us propose then that the the problem isn't the vascular smooth muscle in these patients. It's got something to do with uh, probably the endothelial layer, which would not be an uncommon uh, conclusion. So to summarize uh, this section, what we've, what we've shown is that large cerebral arteries at the base of the brain express vasoactive properties. The large, at least two in the context of arterial CO2. Large cerebral artery dilation varies, though, between the large arteries, between individuals. It is reduced with age, and it seems to be impaired a little bit further with cardiovascular disease. The true mechanisms of all of this uh, have remained unstudied, but uh, they probably will include or reflect the shear stress mechanisms via the endothelial pathways and possibly some pH-sensitive smooth muscle mechanisms as well. So at this point, our data are very descriptive. Uh, we haven't figured out the mechanisms. Okay, so what do we do about this and how, how have we been navigating uh, this, this uh, issue in some of our studies in the recent past? And this is where the next four talks come into play. Um, first of all, you could continue to use MRI to study large cerebral arteries. We fully understand that this is not accessible to everybody and it's expensive. Um, and not everybody likes the MRI system. One of the 
more interesting phenomena we have is that uh, the older people get, and particularly when they have some disease burden, is uh, putting their head into this machine is not the most pleasant thing for them. So you really don't know what you're measuring when they're having a mild anxiety issues in there. Uh, some others, particularly those from UBCO and Phil Ainsley's group and others have been saying, well, let's just ignore the brain altogether and let's measure total flow using a duplex ultrasound of the vertebral arteries and the carotids. And they've been gain, gaining some important insights using that model. Um, Bara is gonna come up next and she's going to talk about uh, her use of still MRI, but uh, she's gonna to talk to you a bit about uh, middle cerebral artery cross-sectional area measures in ramp protocols uh, under a design meant to uh, modify the diameter response. And I'll introduce her more fully later in a minute. Other ways to think about this is um, what, can, what, do we, what can we glean from the TCD signal that is not dependent on the diameter? And recently our attention has turned to compliance of the brain and not so much resistance of the brain. And uh, there's some interesting data here that at least we find them interesting and Aaron and Savannah are gonna present some of those results. And then finally, uh, conduit vessels are useful tools for a variety of things. Um, one of them is do they stiffen with age? And uh, Chris Balestrini has been working on methods to study that problem as well. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, stop and I will address any questions you may have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was an outstanding talk as to be expected from you. Um, we have some excellent uh, questions here from uh, the audience and we'll try and get through a few of these for you. Um, so the first question is from uh, Giri Krishnamurthy. Um, he asked, what type of MRI sequence was used in the 2014 3T study and the 2018 7T study to quantify diameter changes? He says at 7T, we usually expect higher B1 inhomogeneity, and he was curious to know if that affected the measurement in the MCA areas. Uh, a little bit of info on how hypercapnia experiments were conducted in the 7T environment will be helpful. Okay, well, these are based largely on T1 images. Uh, we've had some expert help from the physicists who've been developing these sequences as well to, to improve the resolution. You're, you're absolutely right, though. At 7T, you get a little bit more noise, um, and so we're scanning a little bit longer as well. In terms of delivering CO2, uh, it's, it's done with a low-profile mask that fits underneath the, the head cage, and... Um, you sort of have to get used to that that mask and the way it's delivered, but we've we've managed to use um, and, and purchase these low profile ones that they they work reasonably well based on the doses that we get and very similar in the lab. And I'd be happy to share what we've been doing with you um, offline if you wish. Great, thank you. Um, next question is from Jenna Taylor. Thank you for the very interesting talk, Dr. Shoemaker. What MRI technique do you use to measure cerebral blood flow, uh, phase contrast, arterial spin labeling, for, ex for example? Uh, what MRI technique do you think is the best for measuring cerebral blood flow and diameter changes? Um, you can use phase contrast. We've used that in the past, and you can use arterial spin labeling for that. In a lot of our studies, uh, we've, we've also determined that the phase contrast signal that you use in an MRI gives you essentially the same values that transcranial Doppler does outside of the magnet. And so depending on the, the type of data we want to collect, we generally and often have run the studies twice. One in uh, the lab with the TCD system to get the velocity profile and then uh, repeat the study in the magnet to get the diameter profile. It allows you to um, you know, just have a little slightly better control of the experiments. We have done some though, when, and Barra will uh, introduce some of this as well, where you can, you can interrupt a T1 sequence or a black blood kind of a model to, with a phase contrast so you can collect velocity um, sort of in between your uh, MCA diameter measurements. And Nicole, uh, Nicole's study did that as well uh, back in 2014. And I, uh, did I get the second question? I don't, I think I forgot it. Um, it was just asking what technique do you think is best for measuring ah, blood flow yeah. and diameter changes? Oh, you're asking me to be brave and dangerous. Um, I, I, I would have to say it really depends on what your question is, to be honest. Uh, 
Arterial spin labeling is finicky. It's a very low temporal resolution. Uh, we have found challenges with the small that needed small volume correction based on uh, the age of the patient because cerebral spinal fluid values might be different. And so, um, but, but if you're looking for regional differences uh, across the brain on a voxel wise basis, then you're, you are, you have to use arterial spin labeling or some of the new, uh, the new methods around uh, bold imaging as well, which are giving something that's, that's pretty good uh, analog of, of blood flow. So I, I would say it depends on your question. All of them have been validated in one way or the other, uh, but all of them have their limitations. All of them have their strengths. And the, the problem is the, 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 the processing of the data following the collection as well, which uh, I don't know if you're up to date on some of these things, but there's, uh, there's some confusion about what the right pathway is to analyze some of these data that are very difficult to get. In that regard, TCD remains by far the easiest and most straightforward signal to analyze. So I'll, I'll actually ask a follow-up question just because you said that. Um, so we shouldn't all throw our TCDs away, right? Um, where, where do you see? Oh no, no, no. Where, no. where do you see the benefits of that approach? Um, just, just wait till you see the next four, three, four <laughs> talks, and you won't throw your TCD away. No. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's strengths and weaknesses for the different approaches, but um, yeah. and maybe we'll leave it for the next few talks to go through the, the strengths of TCD, but. I think that's one of the concerns for a lot of us who either don't have access yeah. or can't afford uh, MRI type. Yeah, studies. and that's that's one of the yeah, and sorry that this is one of the reasons I'm sort of pleased to be part of this is to show you that you know, I, I was part of the original problem, and now I'm trying to be part of the solution <laughs> for for people who have TCD systems. They are accessible and affordable. MRI is neither, mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, we have to be careful about how we interpret TCD data. But there are ways to ask, and there are questions to ask that are independent of diameter changes. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, just a few more questions here. Um, so Ashley Ackerman, uh, fascinating talk, thank you. In most figures in your talk, you highlighted marked inter-individual variability in the dilatory response of the large cerebral arteries. What would be your best guess of the largest contributor or contributors to this inter-individual variability? Well, we see, the, we see that some variability in the actual velocity response as well to CO2 across individuals. And if we assume that the real stimulus to dilate in these large arteries is the shear stress induced by the change in velocity, then that might be driving it. And I, to be honest, I haven't, I haven't uh, studied that phenomena very well yet. Also, I, I would not be surprised to know that there are different levels of buffering capacity within the brain and that, it re, that the pH changes in response to a given CO2 dose vary across people based on that. And again, that's something that, that uh, to my knowledge, has not been published, at least not in the literature that I have access to. So those, those are two possibilities. Absolutely. Um, next question is from Justin Sprick. Uh, great talk, thank you. Regarding your data in ischemic heart disease patients, do you think the mechanism underlying diminished cerebrovascular activity in these patients is due to atherosclerosis or other systemic factors that likely contributed to the heart disease in the first place? Alternatively, do you think something that occurs as a result of ischemic heart disease is affecting cerebrovascular reactivity? Um, it's either atherosclerosis or chronic levels of inflammation or antiox or oxidative stress markers, I would think. If it's inter if we again assume that it, it's an endothelial determinant that drives these diameter changes, then um, any one of those factors would actually impair the endothelial contribution to dilation. The trick is sorting out which one. And um, you know there's Problem is too, people with ischemic heart disease are on a lot of medications, and you can't just pull them off for the for the studies that we do. Not in our case, anyway. And some of them are very uh, impactful on oxidative stress, atherosclerosis, and uh, even the the different, you know, the Cox pathways. Of course, they're all on aspirin, and that that might make some. It, it, it's protective of the endothelial from an oxidative stress protective, but it impairs some of the Cox mediated. Uh, vasoactive properties as well. Okay, um, I'll just ask one more question and then um, perhaps at the end, if there's any time, we'll get to the, some of the others. Uh, Kevin, if, if 
uh, elicited a, a, a lot of interest, so <laughs> lots of questions here. Oh, um, but uh, Igor Fernandez asks, uh, great, he says, great talk. Have you measured blood pressure when control and IHD folks underwent CO2 exposure trials? Could you talk a little mm. bit about the likely influence of large cerebral artery reactivity to blood pressure in these data? Yeah, um, we do measure blood pressure and the, the blood pressure response seems to be augmented in older individuals to CO2, at least in, in our studies. And um, that presents another another problem for us and whether that changes the diameter directly is a, is a really important question. Um, I can't say that I have the answer to that. The, the interesting part of that question though too is that these vessels are inside a pressurized cranium and to what extent does that pressure prevent the, the distension of the vessel by a change in blood pressure? But uh, I don't have the answer to your question, but it, it, it's, a, it's a complicated one as well. And I apologize, I don't have that answer yet, but blood pressures do change, depending on the dose of CO2 you give them. Absolutely, that, that uh, co-founder is always important to measure mm, and then yes. try and account for it, so yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, um, I think we'll wrap up the questions there. Um, once again, thanks so much, Dr. Shoemaker, for your great presentation and your contribution to this uh, seminar series. And I'm gonna now kick it over to you to, to uh, chair the rest of the session with your abstract talks. All right, well, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Bara al -Khazraji. She was a postdoc in my lab for four delightful years. And um, had her children in my lab, well, well, one of the two, not in my lab, uh, during the period she was in my lab. And um, one of the more creative and uh, independent postdocs you'll, you'll come across and uh, inventive and uh, worked with, uh, you know, had the capacity to work with our physicists on some projects to, uh, to advance MRI techniques and things like that as well. So I'm pleased to have her present next. And Barra, if you wanna share your screen, I want to get the name of her talk proper or accurate. So she's going to talk to us about the middle cerebral artery cross-sectional area measures in ramp and steady state cerebral vascular reactivity protocols. And so, uh, Bara, I'll turn it over to you. And Is the display okay? Uh, no, you're actually showing both. So if you could uh, switch back. Oh. There you go. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So thanks so much, uh, Pat and Patrice, for organizing this. I mean, I've only been hearing really good things about everything. Everyone's talks have been awesome. The questions have been great. Uh, so thanks again for organizing. And while I am at McMaster now, uh, all these data were collected while I was doing my postdoc under the superb mentorship of Kevin Shoemaker um, over at Western University. So like we saw with Kevin's talk, the middle cerebral artery blood velocity is quite sensitive to changes in partial pressure of end tidal carbon dioxide, where increases in the partial pressure of end tidal carbon dioxide and decreases will then cause uh, associating increases and decreases in the middle cerebral artery blood velocity. And the, the amount of the increase or decrease of the response of this for a given change in partial pressure of end tidal carbon dioxide is what we call supervascular reactivity. So really, because we're looking at a change in the y-axis over a change in the x-axis, essentially we're just reducing CVR, or cerebrovascular reactivity, to slope analysis between the middle super artery blood velocity and the partial pressure of entitled tidal carbon dioxide. Now, the more common stimulus that's used to assess CVR is the steady state hypercapnia protocol. And this just entails delivering some level of desired or elevated hypercapnic uh, dose above baseline and looking at two, two points of interest. So one at baseline before uh, the hypercapnic stimulus and then one at some point near the end of the hypercapnia. And so uh, a more recent study has shown that depending on where you're looking at for the hypercapnic stimulus or taking that measurement, the epoch of interest can affect your CVR measurements. And so I will direct the audience to a really good comprehensive study that just came out recently by Claire Burley from San Lucas' group that did look at the effect of epoch selection on when calculating CVR. But for the purposes 
of this talk and for the, the majority of how you know, most of us do it, we're essentially looking at that last you know, 30 seconds or, or one minute window near the end of the hypercapping stimulus. And it just boils down to these two points then. And so really the CVR reduces down to the slope of that relationship uh, between MCA blood velocity and the end tidal CO2. And so while most of these studies are measuring blood velocity, oftentimes we can see the, that measurement called MCA blood flow. Uh, so centimeters per, uh, centimeters per second versus mils per minute. And so MCA blood flow can be represented by blood velocity, um, but transcranial Doppler ultrasound only really gives us blood velocity measures. And it can act as a surrogate of blood flow, but only when we understand that blood flow is related to, is, is a product of mean blood velocity and vascular cross-sectional area. And so this measurement here is quite uh, difficult to, to acquire unless you're adding on another imaging modality, modality like we saw with the previous talk using MRI. So for blood flow to be truly represented by, or as close as possible represented by uh, changes in blood flow velocity, then we have to assume or accept that vascular cross-sectional area is unchanging in that MCA blood velocity is a surrogate of MCA blood flow when cross-sectional area is constant. But is it constant? Well, like we saw in the previous talk with Nicole Coverdale's work when she was doing her doctorate uh, with Kevin Shoemaker, and I'm just going to focus on the hypercapnic protocol here, uh, she had noticed that when we, when we measure supervascular activity, the value really depends on whether you're using MCA blood flow so then the gray versus MCA, uh, sorry, MCA blood velocity in the gray versus MCA blood flow in the black. And that at, when we measure C CBR using cerebrovascular uh, MCA blood velocity, we underestimate cerebrovascular reactivity compared to when we incorporate the cross-sectional area changes that occur under hypercapnia and use CBF as an index of, of, of the change with respect to the corresponding change in end tidal CO2. So when it comes to the cross-sectional area changes during hypercapnia, we're concerned with the hypercapnic stimulus at the brain level itself and what's happening locally, what the vessel's seeing, but also systemically. So what is the corresponding change in, in other systemic hemodynamic parameters, such as systemic blood pressure or mean arterial pressure? And other considerations also include the magnitude and the duration of the hypercapnic stimulus. So the studies that, the more recent studies that have looked at using this protocol and have looked at uh, how hypercapnia does affect cross-sectional area for a range of end tidal CO2s from baseline between seven to 15 millers of mercury, in all cases have found that cross-sectional area does increase during this protocol. And if it really comes down to looking at these two points, and for the most part, we're then ignoring the middle, what if we use something like a RAM protocol? where the endpoints are going to be the same. However, we're just, and we're just gonna use uh, the endpoint and look at how that changes um, CVR relative to the hypercapnic protocol. So with a similar endpoint then in partial pressures of end tidal carbon dioxide, would a ramp hypercapnia protocol also lead to the cross-sectional area changes that we see in the steady state hypercapnia protocol? And this really brought us to our, our main research question, which was, can we develop a CVR protocol that limits the changes in mean arterial pressure and cross-sectional area. And what we did is we recruited 12 individuals, young, healthy adults, and we looked at middle cerebral artery, cross-sectional area, blood velocity, arterial pressure, we calculated cerebral blood flow as a product of uh, middle cerebral artery, blood velocity, and cross-sectional area, and calculated cerebrovascular reactivity across two protocols, steady state hypercapnia and a ramp hypercapnia. We used two sessions. So one, the first session was just using the transcranial Doppler ultrasound, and the other session was using uh, the 7T MRI, where we looked at, where we assessed continuous anatomical 14-second scans of the middle cerebral artery cross-sectional area. And then, and then in the scan, we also interrupted the steady state hypercapnia and collected blood velocity during, during the MRI scan. Now, in order to, to manipulate the partial pressure of entitled tidal CO2, we used and also targeted uh, the, this value using the RESPRAC device. And so our two protocols here, the steady state hypercapnia was around three minutes of this positive five from baseline. And then our ramp hypercapnia went from negative five to positive five. But the end point was that at the end of each protocol, 
both protocols reach a delta-5 millimeter mercury uh, relative to baseline. And this is just the time course of what we found during the steady state hypercapnia. So I'm going to walk you through on the x-axis. This is just time throughout the protocol. And the y-axis, here we have the actual uh, uh, delta change in partial pressure of end tidal CO2 during the TCD protocol, during the MRI protocol, the delta in the MCA blood velocity, the delta change in mirror arterial pressure, and the delta change in um, middle super artery cross-sectional area. And this bar here, just to indicate that some point during, these, during this bar is when we interrupted the scan to uh, acquire our, our phase contrast MRI or blood velocity measures. And if you recall, like I was saying earlier, there are these two points of interest that we're focusing on when it comes to steady state hypercapnia uh, protocol. And so what we found then is that when we look at uh, baseline compared to the steady state hypercapnia condition for the changes in the partial pressure of entitled CO2 during TCD and MRI session, the, uh, partial pressure, these partial pressures went up during the, the hypercapnic condition relative to baseline, and blood velocity went up during hypercapnia compared to baseline uh, for both the TCD session and the MRI session. Mean arterial pressure did not change between the, the two uh, conditions, whereas MCA cross-sectional area did change between hypercapnia and baseline. So here's just a summary of what we found for the steady state hypercapnia condition. Now, when it comes to the RAM protocol, I'm just gonna throw back up the, uh, the steady state hypercapnia data just so we can compare it to the, hy to the RAM hypercapnia data. So here then, these are the same, uh, same variables. We have the delta uh, partial pressure of end tidal CO2 during TCD, MRI, the delta change in MCA blood velocity, mean arterial pressure, and the cross-sectional area of the MCA. And in order to see how these variables change throughout the protocol, we asked, is the slope significant from zero? And so wherever you see that there was a, a change in or a, a, a p-value less than 0 0.05, then there was a significant uh, or a non-zero slope uh, for that protocol, for that variable throughout the duration of the RAM protocol. So partial pressure of end CO2 during uh, TCD and MRI, the blood velocity and mirror arterial pressure did change throughout the protocol, but the MCA CSA did not. So here's a summary of the steady state hypercapnia protocol, the findings, and this is what we found for the ramp. So the MCA CSA did not change, unlike, unlike the change that was observed during the steady state hypercapnia. And while statistically the, M the mirror arterial pressure did change from hypocapnia, um, it was less than two millimeters of mercury. And for how we interpret that is that it's, it, we don't think it has that much of a difference or an impact on cross-sectional area. However, that's not to say that we can account for that, that two millimeter of mercury change. So I am throwing it up there just to be transparent that we did see a statistical difference here for that mirror to pressure value. So when it comes to CVR then, uh, for these two protocols, we really wanted to look at um, how, how does the um, MCA blood velocity CVR, when we measure it, how does it differ between these two protocols? So recall, the more, the more common way of calculating CVR is looking at that change in MCA blood velocity for a given change in end tidal CO2. And what we found is that regardless of whether you're using the RAMP or the steady state hypercapnia protocol, the CVR did not change between the two protocols. But when you use MCA blood flow CVR, so the change in, in calculated blood flow for a given change in partial pressure of, of entitled CO2, we found that the steady state hypercapnia had a higher level of uh, calculated MCA uh, blood flow CVR, and that's likely uh, due to the, the corresponding cross-sectional area changes that occur during the steady state hypercapnia, which were absent during the ramp. And if TCD is going to be truly representative of the blood flow change during steady state hypercapnia, then we should see a similar change in blood flow velocity or blood velocity versus uh, blood flow. And what we found is that when we do look at the percent change of either blood flow or MCA uh, velocity during hypercapnia, that the flow was greater. And again, this is likely due to the fact that we are now incorporating the cross-sectional area change that occurred during steady state hypercapnia. So recall that our research question was, can we develop a CVR protocol that limits the changes in MAP and cross-sectional area? And here's our summary of our findings. And these were the two variables or, of interest. So the, 
there was a change in the cross-sectional area for the steady state. There was not a change for the RAM. There was no change in meritorial pressure for the steady state. There was a change, however, it was less than two millimeters of mercury for the ramp. And recall, this is going from hypocapnia to the hypercapnia. The MCA blood velocity CVR was not different between the two protocols, but the MCA blood flow CVR was greater during steady state. And that's, that's we think it's likely perhaps due to the, the cross-section area changes in the steady state protocol. MCA blood velocity alone, so using TCD, did not represent MCA uh, calculated blood flow uh, changes with steady state hypercapnia. So when it comes to thinking about CVR protocols, perhaps the ramp hypercapnia protocol might be worth considering when the cross-sectional areas are not feasible. So when someone's using TCD alone and perhaps does not have access to cross-sectional area measures. There are, the study is not without any its limitations. So we did only look at young healthy adults. We saw earlier that the hypercapnic response in older adults is different. It's likely different too um, in disease states. Although we did, uh, we did recruit six males and six females, we are underpowered for assessing sex differences. Well, it's a very important question to think about for the future. And we did use a narrow range of hypercapnia stimulus, but this was tolerable by our participants and we did not see um, a meaningful change in mere toe pressure. So I, I can't go without giving a huge thanks to Kevin. I mean, he's been an amazing person really to know over these years. Um, he's taught me a lot and especially how to keep the tension high, as he always says. So thank you so much for everything. Um, the research team that's that where this study could not have been done without them. They were amazing. Our sources of funding, uh, Kevin's lab, my postdoc lab, which I miss, which I miss so much. And Kevin, we're so happy you're on Twitter. Uh, so follow him if you haven't already. And, and myself, uh, if you would like to you know, reach out or ask any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, here's my email and here's my Twitter. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Vara. Uh, yes, now Twitter is taking up my time again. Um, all right, so thank you. And there's a, a couple of questions here already. Uh, Alexander Rezumovsky uh, says, interesting presentation, thank you. How accurate will be the MRI di diameter evaluation and what method was used to calculate the diameter? And, uh, and a little bit further here, there was, only, was there only one person who was doing the measurements or did you have others as well? So a bit about the limitations around the measurements. Yeah, for sure. So the... So there are our 7T MRI sequence, it has a resolution of an in-plane resolution, which is where we're actually measuring the cross-section area of 0.5 by 0.5 um, millimeters squared, and then a depth of 1.5 millimeters. So together it's 0.5 by 0.5 by 1.5 voxel. However, that's the raw data. When it comes to actually measuring, and when we're using um, the, pro the DICOM viewer for measuring the cross-sectional area, what the, what the program does is it uses bicubic interpolation, and so it makes the edges significantly smoother. So it's hard to say what our end point resolution was when it comes time to uh, calculating the cross-section area, but it is better than the native resolution of 0.5 by 0.5. And this was something that I had to, you know, scratch my head <laughs> on quite a bit because, you know, talking to the, the MR technicians, they too were saying that it's very difficult to find an end point because at the at the end of the day, when you're using your cross-section area measures and you're using a, a program that's using interpolation, it's smoothing it out to improve the resolution. So it's hard to say what that final resolution was. And then the second question was, oh, right, the, um, the two people. So uh, this was done by a blinded observer. However, um, for, for purposes of seeing whether, um, how it related to, I guess, an expert viewer, um, we took random, random images across the 12 people and then looked at um, the comparison. So here I just have a blend Altman between the, the two inter-rater variability between the cross-sectional area measures for the two people. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Basad asks, very interesting data, Bara. What was the background for using plus five millimeters of mercury for hypercapnia trials? And second part, would you see comparable results for the MCA cross-sectional area and blood pressure in response to higher changes in entitled CO2? So I'm gonna 
I guess I'm going to answer both at the same time, if that works. So our, our initial thought with the with the um, keeping it within that five delta was actually to avoid corresponding changes in mean arterial pressure. So I don't, I do think that with higher end tidal CO2s that you would see increases in mean arterial pressure. And it's hard to then say what is going to be a, res a vasomotor response to the CO2 um, versus the mean arterial pressure changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Heather, time for one or two more here with nice short answers like that. Uh, Heather Edgel, thank you. And um, what was the timing of the two protocols, i.e., when was the steady state average taken and how long was the RAMP protocol? So the steady state hypercapnia was three minutes and then the um, RAMP protocol was four minutes. And to, just to, I, I think I may have missed this also in my talk is that, so they are the, the two sessions, the TCD session and the MRI session were within an hour of each other. So the entire start to finish um, from setting up, calibrating the respract and everything took about an hour. And then right after that, they jumped into the MRI or vice versa. So we would randomize the order of whether someone was doing MRI first versus TCD first. Okay, and one more question, and I like this one uh, because it's, it might challenge us a little bit. Uh, this is from Merrick Zanath, uh, hmm, sorry about pronouncing the name, uh, Zaznika. Um, during CVR testing, not only mean arterial pressure may change, but also intracranial pressure. And what can we do about that, about a change in intracranial pressure, and how's that, how might that be uh, affecting the measurements? I don't know. Um, I don't know that... I don't know how much of a change we would see at, at this modest level of hypercapnia. I, I honestly can't answer that. But, um, I mean, all I can say is that you can look forward to the upcoming talks looking at ICP and how that affects, I guess, compliance in the brain. But in terms of CVR measures directly, I don't, I don't suspect it might make a big difference within the, our narrow range, but um, it, might, it might matter more when you're looking at higher higher end tidal CO2s, but again, I, I don't know the influence of that. All right, well, thank you. I think we're gonna uh, just uh, cut off the questions at this point for this talk. Uh, there are some more, and then perhaps I can get them over to Bara so that she can uh, address them personally. Okay, uh, next up, um, I'd like to introduce Erin Moyer. And if you could share your talk, Erin. So Erin is in her final year of doctoral studies uh, in, uh, in our lab and um, has spent the bulk of that time thinking about the problem of cerebrovascular compliance in the brain. And um, she's gonna present some data here showing us that cerebrovascular compliance represents a discrete mechanism for the regulation of cerebral blood flow in humans. And uh, this is a TCD study. So Erin, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And uh, I just wanna start by thanking uh, Dr. Broussards and Dr. Rickards for organizing this excellent series. And I'm excited to present to you today on cerebral vascular compliance. So historically, studies investigating cerebral auto regulation have focused on cerebral vascular resistance. So here we have the original autoregulation curve, which was proposed by Lawson back in the 1950s. And while the shape of this curve has come into question more recently, specifically this plateau region here in the middle, and how wide this really is in humans, what I want to draw your attention to here is the cerebral vascular resistance response, which is outlined here in red. So our ability to maintain cerebral blood flow, at least at relatively constant levels within this plateau region, really results from these rapid adjustments in cerebral vascular resistance. We also have here the original work which was done on dynamic cerebral autoregulation by Aislett and colleagues. And again, I want to focus your attention on the bottom panel here, which is cerebral vascular resistance. And how Aislett and colleagues evaluated dynamic autoregulation was by assessing the slope of the CVR response relative to the change in blood pressure. And we can see here how the slope is altered at different levels of end tidal CO2. But really the takeaway point of this slide is just that cerebral vascular resistance does represent the fundamental response behind cerebral autoregulation, at least historically. 
However, by focusing solely on cerebral vascular resistance, we are overlooking the pulsatile characteristic of flow, or more precisely, the mechanical properties which are governing pulsatile flow. So in particular, vascular compliance enables within beat vascular distension during systole and recoil during diastole. And this does contribute importantly to blood flow to a vascular bed. So this is evidence from the forearm circulation, and this was done by our laboratory back in 2007. And if we look on the left-hand side here, cerebral vascular resistance, or sorry, vascular resistance in the forearm bend and vascular compliance were evaluated using a Winkessel modeling approach. This was evaluated under two conditions. So the first condition was when the arm was in the neutral position. So this is at the level of the heart. And the second condition was when the arm was elevated above the heart. And what we can see is that vascular resistance does remain unchanged between these two conditions. However, we do see that there was a significant increase in vascular compliance here when the arm was elevated above the heart. Also in the study, uh, two sympathoexcitatory maneuvers were used, so lower body negative pressure as well as the cold presser test. And with lower body negative pressure, we do see that there is a significant change in both vascular resistance and compliance. But again, if we take a look at the cold presser test, we see here that vascular resistance was not changed during the cold presser test, but there was a significant reduction in vascular compliance. So this study importantly demonstrates that vascular resistance and vascular compliance can independently regulate blood flow through a vascular bed. And more recently, these findings or similar findings have actually been um, extended to the cerebral vascular bed. So this is a study done by Chan and colleagues back in 2011, and they used phenylephrine and sodium nitroprusside infusions to cause these transient increases and decreases in blood pressure respectively. And the MCA velocity responses were measured throughout these two conditions. And you can see that's outlined in these graphs by the solid black line. And then what they did was they used a Winkessel model which incorporates both a vascular resistance and a vascular compliance element to predict the MCA velocity responses. And they compared this to a single resistance model, which was also used to predict the MCA velocity responses. And what we can see here quite clearly is that the Winkessel model, which is outlined by this dashed line, better predicted the MCA velocity responses in both conditions when we compared this to the single resistance model, which is outlined here by the uh, dotted line. So this study does a really nice job of demonstrating that in the brain, both vascular resistance and vascular compliance are important in determining blood flow outcomes during these alterations in blood pressure. And while the previous study demonstrates that vascular compliance is important, what we do not yet understand is exactly how vascular compliance is changing during these blood pressure alterations. So this here is a tracing from one participant during a sit to stand protocol. And we have blood pressure on the, in the top panel here, and then our blood velocity from the TCD in the bottom panel. And if we take a look at blood pressure, we see that there is a significant reduction in mean pressure upon standing. So in young healthy adults, on average, mean pressure drops about 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, but I wanna, what I wanna point out here is that we see that there is this reduction in both the systolic component as well as the diastolic component of pressure. But if we do compare this to our blood velocity response, we do see there are some differences here. So with the blood velocity response, while diastolic blood velocity is decreased, we see that systolic blood velocity is actually maintained here at the seated baseline levels throughout that hypotensive phase. And as I mentioned previously, vascular compliance does contribute to this pulsatility of flow. So this led us to believe that an increase in vascular compliance was occurring with standing, which was helping to um, contribute to this preservation of systolic blood velocity. So the objective of the present study was to quantify with in-beat changes in both cerebral vascular compliance and cerebral vascular resistance during transient reductions in blood pressure. And this research tested the hypothesis that cerebral vascular processes, which accompany transient reductions in blood pressure, would involve increases in cerebral vascular compliance 
which would contribute to the preservation of systolic blood velocity. So we had nine young healthy adults participate in the present study, and that included three females. And the participants performed a sit to stand task. So it involved three minutes of sitting, followed by three minutes of standing. And that protocol was repeated twice. And throughout the protocol, we collected um, ECG, blood pressure with phenomena, blood velocity waveforms with TCD, as well as n tidal CO2. And the approach we took for the analysis was we actually extracted individual blood pressure waveforms and the corresponding blood velocity waveforms. And these waveforms were input into a Winkessel model, which calculated an index of cerebral vascular compliance and an index of cerebral vascular resistance. So more specifically here, we have um, the tracing of ECG blood pressure and blood velocity during the sit to stand. And this vertical line here does represent the time of standing. So what we did is we went back 20 heartbeats from standing and that's where our analysis began. So that's outlined here with the uh, red box. And from here, every second heartbeat was extracted and input into the model. And that pattern did continue for 20 beats after standing. So in total, we extracted and analyzed 10 beats um, at sitting and 20 beats in the standing posture. And for our results, this figure here is showing the blood pressure on the top panel. In the second panel, we're showing blood velocity. In the third panel, we have the index of cerebral vascular resistance. And in the bottom panel, an index of cerebral vascular compliance. So again, this vertical line throughout this figure does represent the time of standing. So we're going to start by focusing down on cerebral vascular compliance at the bottom. And we can see that upon standing, there is this large increase in cerebral vascular compliance. And that increase did occur rapidly. So it actually began about two beats or two heartbeats, which was equivalent to two seconds following the stand. And as I mentioned, that increase was large. So on average, compliance was increased 165% from the seated baseline values. Now, if we take a look now at cerebral vascular resistance, we can see that there is actually this slight delay before the reductions in cerebral vascular resistance are initiated. So in this case, there was actually seven second delay between when cerebral vascular compliance began to increase and when cerebral vascular resistance began to decrease. This next uh, figure here is just showing the compliance response to standing in all nine individuals. So we see that all nine individuals do demonstrate this large rapid increase in cerebral vascular compliance with standing. And in this figure, we're actually showing the response in both trials of the sit to stand. So trial one is outlined here with the closed circles and trial two outlined with the open circles. And you can see that there is a strong repeatability that is demonstrated between the two stands. However, you will notice that there is a high degree of inter-individual variability in the compliance response to standing and particularly how much compliance is increasing. So this does range from about a 63% increase in one individual up to over 300% increase in another individual. And what we did observe was there was a strong correlation between this change in compliance with standing with the seated baseline compliance. So differences in seated baseline compliance may arise from differences in individuals' cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, there has been a study that was uh, published a few years ago that um, outlined that individuals with higher cardiorespiratory fitness did have greater baseline cerebral vascular compliance. It also could be related to there may be sex differences in this response, which we did not evaluate in the present study, um, and as well the phase of the, uh, the menstrual cycle, which we did not control for in the present study. Those are a few factors which could contribute to these differences seen in both the baseline compliance as well as the change in compliance with standing. And as I mentioned, the hypothesis of this study was that these increases in triple vascular compliance that occur with standing would contribute to the preservation of systolic blood velocity. 
So in order to test this, we simulated a scenario with the model where compliance did not actually increase upon standing. And then we observed what effect this alteration had on the model predicted uh, flow wave form. So in this case, this um, analysis is done in one individual who's a representative. We see that in panel A, this is a heartbeat that corresponded with peak compliance in this individual. On panel B, we took the exact same beat, but we went into the model, manually altered the value of compliance to be equivalent to that individual's seated baseline levels. So that's simulating this um, scenario where compliance is not increasing from a uh, seated baseline. And what you can see that if we take a look at this uh, model predicted flow velocity waveform, which is outlined here in the dashed line, there is a marked reduction in specifically the systolic component of the waveform when we compare that to the actually measured waveform in the solid line here. So this does provide evidence that that increase in cerebral vascular compliance withstanding is contributing to the preservation of systolic velocity during that hypotensive phase of the stand. So in summary, Rapid and large increases in cerebral vascular compliance do occur with standing-induced hypotension. These increases in cerebral vascular compliance also preceded the reductions in cerebral vascular resistance. So it appears that both cerebral vascular compliance and resistance represent independent but complementary means of regulating cerebral blood flow. So in this specific case with standing-induced hypotension, cerebral autoregulatory responses do involve both initial rapid response, which preserves the velocity, followed by a slightly delayed resistance response, which helps to return mean blood velocity or mean flow um, back to seated baseline values. And with that, I just wanted to thank uh, Kevin, my supervisor, um, Dr. Mayor Zamir, who is the mathematician behind the model, so he's been um, a huge uh, help throughout this process. Uh, Dr. Stephen Clawson, who was a co-author on this work, um, and then as well as our past MVRL LBHH members and all the current members as well. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we have uh, a few questions have come in already. Um, the first one uh, was from uh, Dr. Uh, Ronnie Panerai, who asks, uh, who says, first, very interesting. And um, with the interesting question, how do, you, how do the beat by beat changes in compliance uh, relate to corresponding changes in critical closing pressure? Uh, that's a very good question. We did not um, calculate the critical closing pressure. Um, so, unfortunately, I can't um, really answer that question at the moment. Okay. Uh, the second question here, the pulsatility index is often interpreted as an indirect measure of cerebrovascular resistance. Uh, did you measure pulsatility index during this study? And it's just curious to know how this may have tracked your measure of compliance. We did not um, directly measure the pulsatility index. Um, so our Winkessel model does calculate both uh, cerebral vascular compliance and a resistance element. So we use the model um, to calculate the cerebral vascular resistance in this case. Thirdly, uh, Syed Imadadin, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Does your Winkessel model include the ICP as a parameter? So that's a very good question. So with our model, it doesn't include um, intracranial pressure as a parameter. So our model is actually a four element model. Um, so in addition to uh, vascular resistance and vascular compliance, it does include viscoelastic as well as inertial elements, um, but it does not include ICP directly. And then one last question uh, for this talk, uh, again from uh, Patrice Prasad. Did you observe an association between the amplitude of increase in compliance and the resistance response, whether it is the delay before the reduction in resistance or the amplitude of reduction in resistance? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. We did not um, specifically evaluate that in the present study. 
but certainly is interesting to uh, look into in the future whether this change in compliance is um, affecting the change in resistance. Um, like you said, Patrice, whether that would be in either the amplitude of the response or the delay of the response. Um, certainly, I think a very interesting question that hopefully we can tackle um, in the near future. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, we got one last one in here from Ronnie Schondorf. We got to let him in. Um, the fundamental question, why do you think compliance is changing? Now, I'm, I'm, we might need a little more clarification on that, Dr. Schondorf, in terms of uh, the teleologic reason or the, the mechanical reason, or the mechanistic. Um, but it's a really fundamental question. What do you think, Aaron? Um, as I mentioned just very briefly there in the conclusion, I think that we've shown with this study that that increase in compliance is contributing to the preservation of systolic velocity. So if we were to say, take away that increase in compliance, I think what we would see is a further reduction in mean velocity because not only would diastolic velocity be dropping, but also the systolic component would drop as well. Um, so I think by having this increase in compliance, and helping to preserve the systolic velocity, um, that's going to just help improve the autoregulatory response. Uh, he did clarify the question and he is asking about mechanical uh, effects. Do you wanna take a, an attempt at suggesting the mechanical reasons or mechanistic reasons behind that change in compliance? Cool. How, how is it happening? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, the study that we're working on right now is actually um, telling us that that is very complex, what is behind the increase in compliance or the mechanisms behind it. Um, but a few points that I'll, I'll mention um, is blood pressure is one mechanism. Um, so passively, the drop in blood pressure um, would contribute to an increased compliance. And then another component as well is intracranial pressure. Um, so another study of ours previously demonstrated that, at least in the supine posture, intracranial pressure what did appear to actually restrict the compliance of the vessels. So uh, changes in intracranial pressure, particularly decreases in intracranial pressure in these upright postures may contribute as well. I don't wanna go too much into that because Savannah, who's uh, speaking next, is actually going to take you through that or those two mechanisms a little bit further. So I'll probably leave it there to let Savannah deal with that. Okay, thank you, Aaron, and thank you everyone for the questions. Um, so now I want to introduce you to Savannah. And uh, Savannah can bring up her talk. Savannah uh, is, has finished her third year of undergrad and she's going into fourth year undergrad. And so, um, this represents some of the work that she's been doing in our lab as a as a third year student uh, over the past several months. And I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, have her present in this session and to show you some of the work that she's been doing. Uh, Samantha, can you just advance one slide so we can see the title? And she's been working along the same vein as Aaron, uh, but investigating the effect of a change in intracranial venous volume on cerebrovascular compliance at the onset of simulated orthostatic stress. Thank you, Savannah. You can expand that into the presentation mode and great, thank you. Great, hey, first off, I just wanna say thank you again to uh, Dr. Ricards and Dr. Passar for uh, hosting this um, talk. I think it's a very, very good idea um, for everybody to come together and learn a little bit about each other's research. And thanks again for Kevin for the introduction. Um, so my talk will be um, investigating the effect of a change in intracranial venous volume on cerebrovascular compliance at the onset of simulated orthostatic stress. So to provide you with a little bit of background information, compliance is the brief but local distension of blood vessels to accommodate the passage of blood during systole. So basically what happens is you have your blood vessel and every time the heart contracts, that vessel will distend and then it will recoil in order to help propel blood through the vascular bed. Now, there has been a significant amount of research done on, the, on this property of compliance in the peripheral vasculature. However, little has been done to explore compliance in the cerebral vessels. One of the first studies looking at cerebrovascular compliance actually looked to compare the cerebral vessels to the periphery. 
So I first want to direct your attention to this top figure here of the peripheral vasculature. Focusing on the arterial side over here, we see that the vessels have lots of room to distend and recoil as shown by these dashed lines. This is because the vessels in the periphery are surrounded by soft tissues such as the skin and the muscles so that there's room for them to express their compliance. Now looking at this bottom figure over here of the cerebrovasculature, we see that the vessels are located within the rigid confines of the skull as depicted by the thick black line on the outside. Now within the skull, we have our arterial blood volume, venous blood volume, cerebrospinal fluid, and the tissues that make up the brain. All of these components are confined within such a small space inside of the skull and it acts to create this intracranial pressure within the, uh, within the skull. Uh, this pressure as depicted by the arrows right here is thought to be the reason why compliance is suppressed within the cerebral vessels when compared to the periphery. Because the pressure build up surrounding the cerebral vessels, they are not able to express their compliance as effectively as they can in the periphery, as again represented by these dashed lines here. So now this leads to the major question, uh, would decreasing this intracranial pressure increase cerebrovascular compliance? In another study that was just done and actually presented to you by Aaron just a minute ago, uh, cerebrovascular compliance was explored during a sit-to-stand model. So as you recall from her presentation, uh, compliance increased significantly upon standing for a short period of time before returning back to baseline levels, as depicted in this top figure here of compliance, and this line um, depicts the onset of standing. So you see the significant increase in compliance there. Now, simultaneously with this increase in compliance, blood pressure has dropped, as shown in this bottom figure here. So we have the bottom of the blood pressure, and again, this line represents the onset of standing, and you can see that they're in direct correspondence with each other. Um, now, it's important to remember that blood pressure is not the only thing that changes when standing. We also get this hydrostatic drop in cerebral venous volume. As many of you may know, venous volume accounts for about 70% of the total blood volume and may therefore contribute significantly to this intracranial pressure that I mentioned before. So this leads to the question, is the increase in cerebrovascular compliance related to the drop in intracr intracranial venous volume, uh, again, which would contribute to that intracranial pressure uh, that occurs with standing? So the purpose of the present study was to determine whether intracranial venous volume is influencing the changes in cerebrovascular compliance. And this research tested the hypothesis that increasing intracranial venous volume would result in a decrease in cerebrovascular compliance, and decreasing intracranial venous volume would result in an increase in cerebrovascular compliance. So for the purposes of the study, we recruited eight young, healthy adults, four males and four females. And in order to be included in the study, we asked that participants had no conditions affecting or, affecting or impairing autonomic functions and that they be fasted for four hours and refrain from alcohol, caffeine, or exercise within 12 hours prior to testing. So the instrumentation list is uh, displayed below. However, I'm just gonna highlight a couple things that were important for analysis. So the electrocardiogram, uh, the finger photoplethysmography for um, measures of continuous arterial blood pressure, as well as the transcranial Doppler ultrasound of the MCA uh, to measure um, continuous blood flow velocity. Um, those are the three things that we use uh, for our analysis model to calculate uh, compliance, as Aaron mentioned before. Um, we also use our measured central venous pressure, and this was done by inserting a catheter into one of the antecubital veins, and it was aligned to the level of the heart, as you can see in this figure here, um, in order to get the accurate, accurate reading of central venous pressure. And then to measure the dependent variables, we also used um, an inflatable neck cuff, which is a blood pressure cuff surrounding the neck. Um, and it was inflated to plus 20 millimeters of mercury in order to try and reduce that cerebral venous, or venous uh, drainage from happening in order to increase that in intracranial pressure. So as you can see in this ultrasound figure on the left, labeled by A is the internal jugular vein and B is the carotid artery. And this figure is just at supine rest. And then if you look at the ultrasound image on the right, uh, you can see now that with 20 millimeters of mercury inflation, we have a collapse of the internal jugular vein. And again, that would act to reduce that drainage and hopefully increase the intracranial pressure. We also used a lower body negative pressure box, um, as you can see in this image here, in order to create a negative pressure environment surrounding the lower half of the body. And this acted to um, encourage cerebral venous drainage uh, from the brain into the lower half of the body. Um, in order to reduce that intracranial pressure to see what happens.
So we started off with a five minute baseline period. And following this, we did two repeated trials of net cuff inflation to plus 20 millimeters of mercury. So the cuff was inflated and then it was uh, left on for 30 seconds. And then we deflated it and then they got a two minute rest in between um, each of those two trials. We then did a sudden onset LBMP protocol um, and we did this with three different levels. We did um, LBMP negative 10, negative 40 and negative 80 millimeters of mercury pressure. Um, and these were all done in a randomized order um, and each repeated twice. So the LBMP would turn on for 10 seconds and then they get a minute of rest in between um, for those trials. And the final protocol was a sudden onset LBMP and net cuff inflation protocol. So again, it was two repeated trials here. And what we did is um, we inflated the net cuff to plus 20 millimeters of mercury and then immediately turned on the LBMP um, to negative 80. And again, the LBMP was on for 10 seconds and then the cuff was deflated and they got one minute rest in between each of those two trials as well. So for our data analysis, as I mentioned before, we use the ECG, brachial blood pressure, and TCD waveforms. And as Erin mentioned in her previous study, we kind of did the same model um, of using a beat by beat basis, so analyzing every other beat. Um, so for my study, we did um, a total of 10 beats prior to the onset of the condition, and then 20 beats after the onset of the condition. Um, and again, that was um, input into this Wincastle model, which gave us our values for compliance. So for our results, um, we st start the results with our net cuff alone. So what we found is there was no difference in mean arterial blood pressure or central venous pressure between baseline and net cuff inflation to plus 20. So as you can see down in this, um, these first two graphs, we've got mean blood pressure and CVP. Uh, the first line with the open circle is the baseline. And with the square, we've got our net cuff inflation and all the individual data in between. So neither of those were significant. However, there was a significant decrease in cerebrovascular compliance from baseline to that net cuff inflation. Oops. Um, and again, you can see that here with the baseline down to um, when it's inflated. Moving on to our sudden onset LBMP protocol, um, we were able to compare the negative 80, 40, and 10 LBMP. So we'll start with uh, looking at blood pressure here. And you can see that uh, there was a significant drop in blood pressure for each um, of the conditions. And there was actually a difference between all um, of the LBMP conditions. So we had um, a different drop in each of them. And there was a significant interaction effect, which led us to run the statistics on the delta blood pressures uh, for each of them. So again, that's that Nadir blood pressure minus the baseline. And what we found here is that there was actually a significant difference between LBMP negative 10 and negative 80, as well as negative 40 and negative 80. However, there was no significant difference in the drop in blood pressure between LBMP negative 10 and negative 40. Um, we also saw a significant drop in CVP in um, all three levels. However, there was no difference in that between each of the LBMP levels. It just, they dropped in all of them. So now looking at our compliance, um, we can see here um, with this figure of compliance that an LBMP 10, 40, and 80, um, they all, inc a compliance increased in every single one. So you can see that from the white bar to the black. So you have your peak compliance, which is significantly different in all of them. However, uh, there was no effect of uh, basically the LBMP on it. So um, they all increased the same. However, there was an interaction effect, which again led us to run this delta compliance over here. And what we can see is that it matches blood pressure and that uh, there's a significant difference in the change in compliance between LBMP negative 10 and 80, as well as negative 40 and 80. However, there wasn't a difference between the LBMP negative 10 and 40. And for our last protocol, which is the LBMP negative 80 alone versus the LBMP negative 80 with the net cuff, um, Looking at blood pressure, there was a significant drop um, from baseline, so we have a significant drop for there, but there wasn't a difference uh, between the two conditions. And same thing with CVP, there was a significant drop with the LVMP, however, there was no difference between the two conditions. Looking at compliance, so on this first figure, uh, compliance is along the y-axis and our beat number is along the x. You can see the top figure is just the LBMP negative 80 alone. So where the line is, is the onset of LBMP. And the second line is when we stopped LBMP. And then this bottom figure, same thing, except for this dashed line is when we started inflation of the cuff. Um, and we can see here that, again, compliance increased with that. However, there was no change in compliance between the two conditions. <laughs> 
We then looked at some correlations uh, between the change in compliance and the change in mean blood pressure. Um, and you can see here that there was a significant effect um, for this correlate, or there was a significant correlation, sorry, um, with a moderate effect. Uh, we also ran a correlation with the change in CVP and change in compliance. And again, same thing, it was significant and there was a moderate effect, meaning that both blood pressure and CVP are related at least to the change in compliance. So in conclusion, our, our neck cuff inflation during supine rest caused a significant reduction in compliance without changes in blood pressure. So ultimately we think that this supports the hypothesis that increasing that intracranial pressure will cause a decrease in compliance without that confounding variable of the blood pressure. Second conclusion was that the neck cuff inflation during LVMP negative 80 did not influence the increase in compliance. Um, I do wanna make two notes in regards to that though. So the first one is that the neck cuff was inflated and then LBMP was immediately turned on right after that. So maybe we didn't see the effects. We're thinking if we would have had like a little delay period between um, when the cuff was inflated and that onset of LBMP, there might have been effect um, with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was that there could also just be a difference, like intracranial pressure could be affecting compliance differently um, during supine rest and during dynamic changes in blood pressure. That could be another um, option. Uh, all the LBMP levels caused an increase in compliance in addition to a decrease in blood pressure and CVP. So this suggests a relationship between the effect of intracranial pressure and the distension of the vessel and the ability of elastin versus collagen to bear the tensile burden. So going back to this figure over here, um, if we have that decrease in intracranial pressure, that would allow more room, I guess, for the compliance to express or for the compliance to be expressed. However, with uh, blood pressure too, if that's reduced, uh, the diameter of the vessel will decrease and then you might just be on the more favorable side of your elastin. So then that compliance could be expressed more as well. So then the correlations between compliance and blood pressure as well as compliance and CVP suggest that both blood pressure and intracranial pressure are likely both contributing to the changes in compliance. So I just want to give a special thanks to Dr. Kevin Shoemaker and Aaron for your continuous support um, on this project. And I'd like to thank everybody else in my lab too uh, for all your help and support as well. So thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Um, I have a question to start. So Aaron talked about a stand um, where you have both intracranial pressure and blood pressure falling. How analogous to that was the LBNP protocol? Which of the levels best matched the sit to stand protocol, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, the negative 80 uh, definitely matched the sit to stand. And it was, I would say it was really close to perfectly matching the stand. Um, the LBNP negative 10 and negative 80, the blood pressure didn't drop as much and the compliance definitely didn't increase uh, quite as much, not as much of a trend, I guess. Um, so certainly we did see the increase, but yeah, definitely the 80 was matched uh, the sit stand model. Um, so we have, we have a, a scenario occurring. This is, this is the, uh, the million dollar question that we keep answering around and I, Sort of like you to take a crack at it, Savannah. We see uh, compliance increasing at a time when blood pressure is falling, and so is intracranial pressure in your model. But in your model, the you elevated intracranial, sorry, you reduced compliance with the neck cuff at baseline, but the neck cuff had no effect at minus eighty that you could detect. What do you? How do you explain that? Um, well, one thing that I had mentioned is it is possible that because we immediately turned on LBMP um, as soon as we inflated the cuff, um, it might not have had a significant amount of time to actually increase that intracranial pressure um, as it did with the neck cuff protocol. Um, so that could be one reason. Um, the other reason I think is um, I think as there's more of a change in blood pressure, it could be that that change in blood pressure um, kind of overwhelms the change in intracranial pressure in a sense that it becomes more significant to those changes of compliance than the intracranial pressure. Uh, yeah, seeing as blood pressure drops a significant amount where intracranial pressure seemed to kind of stay the same 
um, reduction regardless of the LBMP level. So it could just be that blood pressure just kind of takes over at that point. All right, uh, we have a question from Heather Edgel who says, nice work, Savannah. What role do you think this might play in fainting? Um, yes, well, we did have to watch that um, during our protocols with the negative 80. Um, yeah, however, I don't think it was like that significant, I guess, as far as like standing. I know people do feel faint when their blood pressure drops so quickly, but again, that's like a natural physiological I guess, mechanism. Um, but yeah, I can definitely see with that drop in blood pressure and that drop in intracranial pressure, um, yeah, how that would play into fainting with the yeah, lower pressure in the brain. It might, it might be an interesting study to capture some of that data, yeah. It, yeah. A lot of people will have that data uh, <laughs> in their labs. So uh, thank you, Savannah. I think we'll, we'll stop there in the interest of time and we'll move on to our last presentation. So Chris Balestrini is just finishing up the PhD component of his uh, MD-PhD program at Western. And uh, he's been exploring the use of phase contrast imaging to study the stiffness of the large cerebral arteries. And so I'll turn it over to Chris at this point. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Thanks for, uh, thank you for, for sticking in uh, till the end. And, and thank you, uh, Caroline and, and Patrice for putting on this event. Uh, my name is Chris Balestrini and I'm an MD PhD student in Kevin's lab. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit from local arterial compliance and discuss what happens when we look at regional cerebrovascular mechanics um, in uh, this presentation titled cerebrovascular pulse wave velocity, looking at uh, phase contrast imaging in the brain. So approximately 20% of oxygen delivery is delegated to the brain. In order to meet the metabolic demands of our command center, blood flow must be high. Therefore, blood flow into the cerebral vessels is met with little resistance. One major feature of the arterial system, particularly the resistance vessels, is the dampening of the pressure waves ejected from the heart to produce steady state flow, ideal for oxygen and nutrient extraction in end organ tissues. As such, the microvascular system is adapted to receive this steady low energy flow. What happens in, arter in arterial stiffening, uh, as in aging, hypertension, and disease, is the pulse wave velocity increases through the vascular system. This simultaneously drives the forward wave faster and elicits an earlier return of the reflected waveform, contributing to augmentation of the pulsatile energy moving into the cerebrovascular, or moving into the microvasculature of end organs such as the brain, which increases the susceptibility for, micro, for mechanical damage. This has been demonstrated in numerous large-scale studies as aortic arterial stiffening is commonly associated with structural and functional cerebrovascular impairments. Commonly used to measure arterial stiffness, tonometry or is a, a measure of uh, pressure pulsations on superficial arteries is used to detect delays between pulse wave arrival transit times along the arterial tree. However, in the skull, due to access limitations, tonometry measures cannot be performed. More recently, Researchers have tackled this problem by taking advantage of the high temporal resolution of ultrasound to assess the transit time of the pulse wave moving from the periphery into the cranium. In a previous study, we used ultrasound of the common carotid artery and transcranial Doppler of the middle cerebral artery to assess the pulse wave transit time in a cohort of mixed vascular pathologies, as Kevin alluded to earlier in the IHD group. We tested the association of carotid MCA transit times to white matter lesion volume, which is an imaging pathological correlate to white matter integrity that is linked to vascular abnormalities. We found that white matter lesion volume is associated with functional impairments, as, uh, as noted by reduced performance on cognitive testing, 
as well as the timing at which the pulse wave moves through the cerebrovascular segment, independent of peripheral vascular stiffening. However, we asked ourselves, is this ultrasound method a true measure of cerebrovascular stiffness? Importantly, a large portion of the arterial segment that we are measuring is extracranial, including the common carotid artery and internal carotid arteries. Also, there is large variability in arterial measurements due to the inherent tortuosity of the cerebral vessels and estimation of the vascular distance based on surface path length. As in Aaron and Savannah's work, as well as Mayer's from earlier in the lab, we know that the pressurized cranial environment affects pulsatile properties of cerebral vessels like compliance. Therefore, we aim to improve upon arterial stiffness measurements with an in the brain with an imaging modality in the form of MRI. Angiogram, angiogram guided phase contrast MRI produces an image based on the net phase shift of moving particles such that the voxel intensity is proportional to blood velocity. This is currently used to measure aortic pulse wave velocity by intersecting the ascending and descending aorta in one scan. We can use this technique while taking, taking advantage of the inherent tortuosity of the cerebral vessels to acquire blood flow velocity data along different, along different, uh, sorry, uh, along different segments of the vessels in the brain. On the left, you can see a representation of where we would place an, uh, an imaging plane on the angiogram. And on the right, you see a loop of the pulse wave moving through the cerebral vessels um, in one of those imaging planes. From left to right here, you see an angiogram of the cerebral vessels, the imaging planes, as noted by the yellow dotted lines, of the internal carotid on top here, and the middle cerebral arteries below. The vascular distance of the segments are outlined in red. On the right, you see an ECG gated flow, flow velocity measurements focusing on the upstroke portion of the cardiac cycle. Expanded, these graphs show the frame delays between the proximal or closed circles and the distal or open circles locations of the internal carotid, carotid on the left and the middle cerebral artery on the right. We applied curve fitting to the pulse waves and used 30% of, of the phase intensity change to mark the arrival of the, of the pulse wave upstroke. The cardiac cycle was imaged in 34 frames to produce temporal resolutions of around 25 milliseconds. We used this phase contrast MRI approach to measure the pulse wave velocity and vascular impedance and calculate the vascular impedance be, uh, between the M1 and M2 segments of the MCA, which were completely within the cranium. We studied eight healthy participants that represented both a younger and an older healthy group. We found that, like in the periphery, middle cerebral artery pulse wave velocity is greater with age. Additionally, Impedance, or the resistance to flow through the pulsatile system, is also greater in the, in the older participant group. Therefore, aging does appear to affect the cerebrovascular pulsatile mechanics in the form of stiffer, large cerebral arteries. One question we wanted to address was how does the cranial environment influence this pulse wave velocity? We compared the pulse wave velocities of the internal carotid arteries to those of the middle cerebral arteries and found that in each participant, the pulse wave accelerated from the extracranial to the intracranial compartments. Additionally, there appeared to be an effective age as the increase in velocity was amplified in older participants. Interestingly, none of our older participants in this study had white matter structural deficits suggesting that the amplification is seen before the presence of detectable white matter change. To summarize, the speed of the pulse wave velocity moving into the cerebral microvasculature is related to structural and functional outcomes. However, the use of ultrasound and transcranial Doppler are limited 
in, produ in producing direct measures of true cerebrovascular stiffness. Utilizing phase contrast MRI allows for the direct measurement of cerebrovascular pulse wave velocity, which we found to be greater with age. We also found that the pulse wave accelerates as it transmits into the cerebrum and that this acceleration is amplified with age. Improvements in spatiotemporal resolution of phase contrast MRI will undoubtedly improve outcomes from this technique. In future studies, we hope to apply 2D and 4D phase contrast MRI while changing our arterial mechanics in healthy and clinical populations to advance our understanding of cerebrovascular change, damage, and therapeutics in vulnerable populations. With that, I'd like to thank everyone who's involved with this project, my supervisory committee, and uh, current and past laboratory members. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And I'll start this uh, question series off as well. And the, the panel, is the, the, the chat room, of course, is open. Uh, could you tell us, Chris, what, what is the temporal resolution of the phase contrast system that you were using uh, for these studies? Like, what, what's the smallest difference you could detect in uh, pulse wave velocity? Yeah, so it looks like we're um, in older adults or uh, in later studies um, when we start um, changing the mechanics of the arteries, uh, we do brush up on the, the, the limitations of temporal resolution. Um, so in this study, uh, we showed that we had about 25 milliseconds um, between, cardi uh, between uh, frames in the cardiac cycle. So um, there have been previous studies to show in the, in the thoracic aorta, which is quite obviously quite a bit larger of an artery, that um, approximately 30 to 40 milliseconds uh, temporal resolution is adequate. Uh, to detect uh, changes. Um, so we, we, we were under that, but we, we definitely are brushing up on, uh, brushing up on the, the, the limitations of, of uh, temporal resolution with this phase contrast imaging. Um, you can always um, kind of uh, create a, a trigger delay on, on that phase contrast image and, uh, and increase your effective temporal resolution, but this would require you, uh, doing multiple uh, acquisition sequences and then uh, interweaving the data, which which presents its own its own challenges. Yeah. All right, thank you. All right, we have a, a question here from uh, Caroline Rickards. A nice talk, Chris. Have you assessed the relationship between cerebral and peripheral arterial stiffness with this approach, and how well are these related across the lifespan? Yeah. So um, in the IHD patients, uh, the, the ischemic heart disease group had uh, increased peripheral arterial stiffness and they had uh, increased um, cerebrovascular stiffness as measured through the, the ultrasound uh, techniques. Um, however, when we correlated these two together, we did not see an association um, between, between the two. So there is some kind of disconnect, um, at least that we measured um, in, in older patients, whether they had uh, ischemic heart disease or the control patients, it's just in a, a pooled sample. Um, there seems to be some dissociation between the peripheral and the cerebrovascular um, pulse weight or arterial stiffnesses. Um, although one caveat to that is that we, in that IHD study, we used uh, local arterial stiffness measures in the common carotid artery um, and compared them with that pulse wave transit time. So they are two, two kind of distinct uh, local versus, versus regional um, arterial stiffness measures. Um, but um, moving forward and uh, in, in future studies that weren't presented here, uh, we do see um, some uh, correlation between carotid femoral values, uh, tonometry measures of carotid, carotid, femoral, value, carotid femoral values, and, uh, and our cerebrovascular measures. All right, certainly more to come. Um, we have another question here. Uh, this will be the last question, I believe. Um, oh, they're rolling in quickly right now. Um, but uh, Giri Krishnamurthy uh, says, sorry, Chris, if I missed this, uh, did you employ time of flight MRA or contrast-based MRA for PC MRI planning? That's the first question. And your images from the neck areas are quite impressive. What type of coil did you use? Uh, so we used, uh, I'll to answer the first question first. Uh, we used a uh, uh, 64 channel head coil. Um, the actual images from um, so yeah, that's from, from the neck area. Uh, the image that I showed of the 
the, the time of flight uh, angiogram on there was actually at, at 70. So I kind of kind of cheated with that one just to kind of show a nice clear picture. Um, but we did these uh, the, the other images at, at, at a 3T scan. Um, but yeah, we used a, a 64 um, channel head head coil that was uh, at Robarts here here in London. Um, yeah, and and the uh, the angiogram images were were time of flight images. Okay. Um, one more, I guess, uh, from Grant Roberts. Very nice talk. Uh, I also have missed this. I also may have missed this, but uh, how was vessel distance measured along the MCA or ICA in order to calculate pulse wave velocity? Uh, was was a separate time of flight or contrast based scan used for this? Yeah, so we used uh, we used the time of flight images. Um, we actually used a combination of, of time of flight images and um, and the phase contrast scans to kind of get uh, break it down into into horizontal and vertical components, and then uh, aggregated them together to get a to get a total distance um, for that, that measurement and then took the, the time delay um, that we got from the phase contrast and, and used that for the, the pulse wave velocity measurements. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you everyone as well for your questions and uh, for your, your kind attention uh, to this uh, seminar. Uh, at this point, I'll hand it back to Patrice or Caroline, I'm not, to Patrice, okay, Patrice. Yes, so Kevin, uh, and uh, thank you for a great seminar and uh, for solid, uh, solid, solid talks uh, to everyone. So congrats. Um, I will just share uh, the, my uh, screen for the next uh, session. So in uh, two weeks, don't forget to register for the, our next seminar, which will be uh, chaired by Ali, Dr. Ali McManus. And with uh, abstract talks from uh, Max Weston, Matthew Rieger, Jack Talbot, and Kristen Talon. So again, thank you for your uh, for your vir virtual presence, and uh, we'll see you uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.